All right. Um, good evening, everyone. So my name is Han, and today, uh, together with Onkush, right, we'll be co-speaking and and sharing the, with you our journey for this uh, this cache that we're building. So basically, this this is a uh, we'll be going through this this uh, unbounded disk cache. Um, so let let me, let me start by introducing to you our company. So basically, IOTA is a top international provider of audience data. So we were founded in 2011. And we have about 60 employees located around the globe. And we are partners with many major ad tech companies in, the, in this space. So in terms of the tech that we are doing, right, um, we handle about 40 to 90,000 queries per second on the web uh, da uh, daily. And we have about more than 500 instances uh, uh, deployed across uh, cloud infrastructure that we own. And mainly we, we work with like Apache Cassandra, we work with Scylla, we work with Kafka, and we, we are now actually venturing into Golang. And of course, we are, we are dealing with Java as well. So let's, let's start with the problem statement that we have uh, <coughs> with regards to this, this cache. So we have this problem where we have a constant flow of URLs that we need to analyze. And we need to cache this, the results of these URLs. Um, so we, we basically have this requirement to have this ability to replicate this cache across different regions. And each instance of this cache has to hold an, a so-called unbounded uh, amount of URLs. I mean, unbound, um, unbounded in the sense that we uh, need to be able to store as many as possible uh, with the resource constraints that we have. And reach needs to be extremely low latency due to the volume that we are we're handling. And we need to have a very high throughput. So we are expecting about 20,000 queries per second in terms of the volume. So this cache will be updated with uh, fresh URL analysis in almost real time in a separate path. So on one hand, we have queries coming in. And then we have on the other side, we have uh, on another path, we have updates coming in post analysis that will be updated into a cache. So I'm, um, this is basically how the topology of uh, what we envision will be like. So basically, in terms of user requests, right, um, this request will be coming into different instances across different regions. Um, we have this microservice that we actually deployed that will be using our disk cache. And with every miss that we have from the cache, it will be flowing into a Singapore data center to be analyzed. And after this, has been anal after this analysis has been done, it's basically pushed back to the, the cache in the various regions. Yeah. So what we came up with initially, right, was a design which basically just consists of a most frequently seen URL cache, and behind it is actually LRU cache, which uh, will evict uh, based on certain size any any uh, URLs that we have not seen for some time. So this two level in memory cache actually uh, for the, for the first level, we just basically pull in like one million records that we have just seen. And we, we, which is most frequently seen, and we put it into a concurrent hash map on the level one cache. And on the level two, we, we basically have a, a Guava cache, which evicts uh, uh, entries that's not, has not been seen for some time. So this was actually a pretty good cache in terms of the heat rate. So we're getting about 77% heats on this system. And it was actually pretty simple to implement. But we have this problem where as the URLs size increases, right? We were not able to hold them, uh, we're not able to hold enough of these records in memory. And this, this hit rate was actually decreasing. So some flaws that we have for this design was basically this bounded URL, uh, this RAM limitation. So up to 60 million URLs we are seeing a day. And basically there's a limit to how much you can cache in memory. So scaling this cache actually um, means that we need to increase the size of memory on the boxes. And that basically translates to exponential prices in, if, in, in the scale of deployment. So the other thing that we were facing, the other problem that we were facing was basic, basically this heap sizes translate to costlier systems. So we have expensive instances with large memory. And also major GCs was actually causing a problem for us. Because we have like a inconsistent latencies and throughputs as the system was doing garbage collection. So this is like 
uh, basically a snapshot of some profiles we have done for the initial version of the system, where you can see like the GCs were happening like almost every minute. So this was every time there was GC, right? There was some um, some spike in the latencies that we're experiencing. So we had to think about another way to to handle this kind of volume. So <coughs> before we we go into that, right? Um, we came into this idea where we could actually use memory map files. So I'm not sure whether you guys are, are familiar with MMAP. So basically, it's a low-level system call, um, which allows code to map files to kernel memory, and for the user space process to actually access this memory as if it was it was in the in, in, in user space. So the, the the advantage of doing this is basically for for us to delegate this this um, memory access right to the kernel space, so that we don't have to do unnecessary copying from this to user space. So if you can see like. If if we split this part this this access into three different portions, right? So they have a user user space portion, the kernel space and hardware. So if we we were not to use MMAP, right? Basically, what happens is every request to a this um, basically go through the kernel. The kernel will request it from hardware, and there will be a copying from from the hardware to kernel and kernel back to the user space. So if you if you use MMAP, right? What happens is you actually map the file. To, to the kernel space, and you access this piece of memory as if it was part of your user space. And in effect, the interaction between the kernel and hardware is done automatically by the kernel. So the Linux kernel will actually handle this, um, this memory management. So it will flush the data uh, through some time cycles. Oh, sorry. And uh, basically, you just have to access it as if, you just have to access the memory as if uh, you're, you're reading through a file. So the, the, van, the van advantages of this is basically there's zero copy. And one good thing is if you are mapping the same file object, right? Basically multiple processes can be using the same shared memory. So one one disadvantage of using MMAP is basically if you have small files, right? Because of the way that MMAP works, so it maps like a page size uh, from, a, from, a, from a file to, to memory. So if your file size is smaller than the page size, basically you're wasting quite a fair bit of uh, uh, of sp memory space there. So let's, for example, if your if your page size is four kilobytes and you are mapping a file that's like one KB, you're basically wasting three three kilobytes of space each time you do a map. So it's suitable for big for files that are actually large large enough to optimize. So how we actually handle uh, MMAP files in Java? So we have this class called Map Byte Buffer. So it's part of the Java NIO package. So it's similar to how you use a direct byte buffer. Basically, this uh, creates a memory region in, in native memory, uh, which is not part of the heap. So after you have done this mapping, right, you can access this byte buffer just like how you access a file. You can actually um, do a random lookup into certain positions in, within the memory space. And the OS actually does a pretty good job of mapping that part of the, of the file to memory. So I mean, this is, this is just some sample code you can use. You can reference to, to see how it works. So this idea of using a disk based cache um, actually allows us to have like a unbounded, sort of like unbounded uh, uh, size. So instead of using traditional like uh, I/O input stream, right, we use Linux memory map to to actually do this mapping from files to memory. So we have the the kind of advantage of having the, the, the speed of access into memory, just just like um, I mean, just like accessing memory, although we are actually reading from this. So the lookup times actually are much better than reading from this. So we we tried and it is is about three milliseconds for a lookup on a on a 115 gigabyte cache with 124 shards. So if you do a traditional lookup, it's about 50 times slower to, to do that. Um, so the the other advantage is this memory access is on off the heap, so there's no GC pressures. So the lookup times are actually quite consistent when you're when you're doing a, a cache lookup off the disk. So, um, so probably I can ask Onkush to describe to you how we design this data cache.
So, okay, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, before we go into the design or how we actually implemented it, so uh, I'll list down the main objectives that we were trying to achieve. So, our main problems were is that this cache is growing a lot. So, I mean, it can't be put in the RAM. So, but the, there's an advantage of pattern that we had so that the we, we have a read pattern which is changing over time, but only few of the keys are hot at a time. So, not every key is hot all the time. So, we don't need everything in the memory all the time. So, we, uh, so we leverage Linux caching for that purpose. Okay, so, <coughs> okay, so how we divide it is, so we write all our cache into the files, but if we had just one file, it will be too huge to look up. So what we did was we initially designed, we divided the f uh, each file into 1024 shards, okay? And how we decide this shard is basically, so all our keys in the cache are using 128 bits, which we uh, calculate using MAMA3 hash, basically. So that gives a fairly random distribution for the cache to go into the equal amount of uh, buckets. So we uh, divide the whole cache into one, uh, 1024 shards, okay? And so at a time, we just need to look into one shard to find per one particular key. So still that was not enough. Uh, we s on the top of that, we built to uh, second in-memory index on each shard, which is basically utilizing the next 12 bits. So uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that each shard is a sorted string I like a SS table in Cassandra. So it's a sorted map or sorted order basically. So we can actually read through sequentially and if we hit the key, then we found it. If we hit a key that is more, uh, that is higher than the key that we are looking for, that means it doesn't exist. Okay, so uh, that is another key aspect that uh, which make it work. So we decided the single file into 1024 shards on top of each shard, we are building an in-memory index with next 12 bits. So basically it's saying that if you're looking for key ranges in this range, this is the position in the file, okay? So advantage of the second level index is that it's in memory and you can increase or decrease the amount of bits that you wanna use for building the index. So if your data is in growing a lot, so you can use more number of bits, uh, although it will take in more in memory, but it will be faster to, it will divide the block even further uh, into a smaller size. Okay, <coughs> so currently the, the shard that we are using is 12, uh, sorry, the block address we are using is 12 bits, and approximately it's uh, like 30, 33 MB on file, and actually 20, 270 MB in mem memory. So the index, second level index is 270 MB. Okay, so, <coughs> So let's come into the lookup path, what we do is. So basically on each request, we generate the key using MAMA3 hash. Then we compute the shard, which shard it belongs to using the first 10 bits of the key. Then we, in, after that we use the next 12 bit to find the logical block that it will lie in inside the shard, okay? So then we map the f uh, file and we start reading from the exact position that we want to. And since we are reading sequentially, uh, Linux is quite uh, quite smart in caching the page faults, uh, handling all the page faults and caching the results. Okay, so this basically means that we uh, we have actually divided uh, the whole cache into four million sub blocks, and we only need to need to read only one block at a time. And since in each block it is in a sorted table in a sorted manner, uh, either we hit the key or we hit the key which is in higher than the key we are looking for, that means it's a miss, okay? And it's if, if your keys are actually very sparse, and there could be a possibility that the block doesn't exist itself. So there's a higher chance you, that's quite optimal that if it is a miss, it's even faster to return, okay? So, but, oh, okay, so, so this is the second part, which how we update this cache. So the cache updates are, coming in on a separate path altogether. So one of the reason why we split into shards was to, to update it. So if it was a one big file, to update it will be very problematic, right, at a time. 
So what we do is what is similar to how, how Cassandra handles compaction. So we had split into shards and whenever update comes we can generate a new shard while the process is still using the older shard. Okay. Once the we have the new update available we swap the files and process just switches to using the new shard. So that is how we are applying the deltas to it. So <coughs> yeah. Okay, so, this is the kind of performance metric that we saw uh, when we were developing it. So, first the first uh, it has basically three metrics that we want to watch. One is the total throughput that we are getting from the cache. So, all this was done on our MacBook laptop 8 core and 16 GB RAM. So, everything constant across all the metrics. So, first stars where we were only where we were only using shards and we did not have the second level index with us. Okay. So, the throughput was not really that awesome actually uh, because we are still using quite a uh, this was this test was done on the disk cache which is 34 GB on disk and if we try to load it in memory it will be much much higher. So, coming back to metrics uh, the throughput was not that really that great and uh, we did not see a lot of improvement in there. So, if you see the throughput is like 98 lucas per second and we were using this is second is the heap memory for the java process and the last one is the actual memory of the host that is being used okay so which actually if you see across all it's being used equally that's simply because linux is it, uh, using all the memory it's available to cache the results okay <coughs> so so one, once we introduce the second level index in memory index it actually improved a lot and but uh, the we were using only 10 bits for the second level index right so and the memory in uh, memory footprint of that index was very very low it was maybe like 10 mb extra in the memory so we thought we can actually do more uh, on the second level index and it will improve our performance even for further so the third one we actually introduced on the second level index to be 12 bit Okay, so which essentially means we are uh, putting a 270 MB of uh, heap pressure extra for that second level index, uh, and it actually gave the throughput even much boost. Okay, so why this works is one of the other reason is what are the earlier problems we were facing with in mem in memory caches earlier was the GC was giving us a lot of problem because we are utilizing the whole heap for cache, and when GC tries to gather garbage it does not find any uh, much because it is all being referenced by the cache right. So, but it does have long GC pauses to try to clean the cache. So, here the beauty of this is uh, using memory map it is all off heap. So, the GC pressure is very very low. So, if you see if you are using how much heap you are using is 500 MB or 340 MB or 850 MB depending on how much second level index you use. So, and the second uh, good point about is like it uses all the memory available and memory management for the host and is done by the Linux. So, if you do not have to dedicate memory for this process if if it is available Linux will use it and will cache the results. And this cache actually works much better if you if you do not have a lot of distributed keys I mean it is not a very random cache like uh, the keys are all random it is like basically hit is very very low right. So, if if you have some like hot URLs or hot keys coming up, but the trend is changing, but only if maybe few uh, keys are hot at a time, then it works out pretty well because Linux will keep them hot in the memory. So, if, if it is not too random, alright. So, <coughs> so, but everything is uh, so okay. So, coming to the performance of cache that we are using currently. So, currently we in production we have on disk 115 GB of data. Uh, which are translated to like 3.8 billion records uh, and if we had to put it in the memory actually like using some other in memory solution it will be very huge amount. Uh, so, current shard is exactly by 1024 which is 124 MB and the index is as I mentioned to, to about 270 MB in the MB. So, and the current latency that we are facing uh, is 3 millisecond per lookup this is average latency. So, actually when we started we only had about of uh, 34 GB of cache 
and the latency mean latency used to be around 1 millisecond so it's actually linearly grows as the amount of data grows because the buckets are getting heavier and heavier so if you need even sub suboptimal like even better performance you can actually create more number of shards or more number of second level indexes okay so <coughs> and also since it's multiple f files you can actually do perform concurrent lookups uh, which uh, using the bat, uh, mat byte buffers and so for example the best one we when we were developing it we got on a 73k lookups per second for 32 gb of cache uh, with 16 threads uh, that is on macbook 8 core and 16 gb ram okay. so currently it is running on r32x large machine uh, sorry sorry about that and so basically it is 64 gb ram so and but we have dedicated only like uh, 1.5 gb of heap to the process but linux effectively leverages all the rest of the ram okay so this is a snippet from actually production code that we are having so uh, this is like few few times a day we have a very high lookup uh, pa patterns so it, if you see the that's on the second left hand side you will see the throughput that we are handling and on the right hand side you will see the millisecond latency that we are having for that this is the mean latency oh yeah uh, sorry nine second about that and if you see uh, it's more the latency is more or less consistent and we are able to from one single machine we are able to handle like 12 11k qps uh, quite efficiently and the disk size is 115 gb right now okay so let me show you uh, a small demo of how this cache works so we have this uh, uh, currently uh, we have all the actual data from our production copy to a separate test server so currently the cache is hot not hot so basically uh, if you see all the memory is free there is no buffer everything anything so this is the it definitely requires some cache warm up to for a look to cache the results so let me try to do some so ok uh, sorry let me kill that ok let me so here I am trying to do let us say let us do 25,000 lookup 20,000 lookup so currently the cache is not warm and I am trying to do uh, 20,000 lookups with using 8 number of threads ok so it will about take about like I think if I am not wrong like about 30 seconds which is not good right uh, for 20,000 lookup the throughput is not that good but it mostly is because the cache is not warm uh, ok let me another good thing about mem memory map is that that you do not have to do the cache warm up in the application so if maybe your app died but the Linux is, I mean the OS is still running uh, it will still the cache will still be there so when you restart your application the cache is already there so currently this guy finished so we use 8 number of threads ok so we use 8 threads and it took about 27 seconds and almost like 10 milliseconds per lookup which is not good actually ok so uh, let me run the same command without any change and let us see the difference ok so if you see it actually next time it took less than a second and uh, and the latent uh, latency per lookup is like 350 microseconds uh, it's mostly because the keys didn't change and linux already has them in cache right so it actually this cache depends a lot on how your workflow is so if you have few hot items at a time it will work out pretty good for you so let's try and talking about the second parameter which is basically you can parallelize request and get, get it even further better performance so let's try with 32 threads yeah so it is this one is even better like overall throughput it's increased from so it increased from 22k lookups per second to 30k lookups per second although average latency will will be higher because there are more number of threads cont uh, contending for the same resources and everything but the overall throughput is quite high and the average latency is 1 millisecond 
Right. So yeah. Uh, so if uh, the last point I want to make is like, if you in, if you change the keys actually, so instead of twenty thousand keys, I actually introduced eighty thousand more keys. Right. This should ha this will have a hit about it. So because the keys are, keys are new, and it will take some time to set it uh, for Linux to cache it. Okay. Okay. Let me try it out. Taking a lot of time. Okay, all right. I think we can get back to it. Yeah, uh, I think it might take a few seconds actually to finish the full lookups. All right, so coming back to some quirks with it, like uh, everything is not good with memory. Right? It's not uh, that it's very very good. So some of the things that we found bad about it, uh, one thing is the ma uh, the maximum limit of a file that you can map is 2 GB. Uh, you can't uh, map a file bigger than that. So, but I mean, for this particular case, since we are sharding it, so it's not a problem for us right now. But in in just in case, yeah. Second thing is in Java, like native memory is actually not cleaned up fast enough. So when you create map by buffer, it creates the file handles and it will not collect those garbage collect those file handles and free up the native memory until actually full gc runs so there is a disconnect between native memory and a heap actually uh, and there is a no actual api to unmap files uh, so we, we 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 are using normal byte buffer and you have to use a hack kind of a way to clean them up actually okay so you can you have to use unsafe class to clean basically sorry so this, this method is not actually portable, so it, it works for the current JVM we're using, but if you, if you have a different JVM that doesn't have this particular cleaner class, right, it will work. Can you still run it in Java now? I, I guess it should be still there. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> what? No, can you run it in Java 9? Yeah, oh, yeah we haven't checked that. So coming back to like this 100,000 lookup look quite a lot of time actually. If I run the same thing again, it will be very fast because everything will be in the cache. So. Uh, yeah, so it, it's like very, very fast compared to the previous one, invocation, yeah. And the throughput is quite good. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions, anybody? Uh, yeah. I have one question. Is it when you, when you add new data, you need to read the whole shaft into memory, then add, append the new record, then rewrite the whole shaft? Yeah. So how it works is the it's more like so both the files, the existing shard and the new delta coming in are sorted, right? So what we do is a basically a merge operation. So we keep right reading both files and just uh, interleave as per the uh, ordering and just create a new shard. The reason for it is you can e easily just swap the file, and the changes will be immediately available. And this offline ca uh, compaction can happen offline. Is it a fragment? Because if you keep uh, create a file and write a new file and you don't have a consecutive space to contain the file. Sorry, uh, can you can you come, come again? Yeah, def definitely you need some access space, right? Because while you're generating the new file, right, you're actually uh, using that amount of capacity as well. So at the time, uh, only when you swap it, then you can clean up the the old index. But basically, the shard that you're trying to generate, right, will be taking up space. So probably you need to have some access space for this for this thing to happen, for this compaction to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, this new fragment. If you suddenly your car is not all of the block of your car is not happen consecutively on the disk space anymore, is it and we go from the issue? Um, Sorry, uh, uh, so you've been saying that the block is full already? Like, like if one block in this portion is in the disk and the next block yeah. of the file actually happens to go into the next portion quite far from the, the first possibility, is it a concept? Uh, not really actually. So because first thing is we actually hold the index where which block we want to look into. So it, we just directly go to the block itself, if it exists. You mean the, you mean the, the block on the disk, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think if, if it gets fragmented on the disk. Oh, okay. Well, I think we're using uh, SSDs the, for this case. Um, probably the... Oh, 
So it's, it's on yeah. SSD and I mean, yeah, Linux mostly had, had uh, handling all the memory management basically behind the scenes. Anybody else? Any questions? Any questions? Other questions? One more question. Does that matter for the most of what is it on the low volume or on the EBS volume? Uh, it's in the storage. In. Ephemera. 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 Sorry, is the client who's using the cache is collocated with the nodes and shards uh, of yeah. the cache itself? Yeah, so let me go to the topology that we are having. Uh, yeah, so we intend to deploy this cache in multiple regions so that we are collocated to the client. But, but it's not instance uh, collocated, it's region collocated, right? It can be either. We can put this anywhere. Uh, and so did you measure any performance differences if the client and the shard is on the same EC2 instance or uh, different? Oh, currently it is on the same machine, both of them. All right. So, so because uh, the application doesn't need much resources to run to do lookups, it's mostly the ja uh, cache is using all the resources of the application. So that was one mm -hmm. of the intended, so that we don't have to infer uh, network calls, which has uh, latency added. So to avoid those, actually, we went. One of the reason was to disk cache. Okay, uh, and a follow-up question: Are you using any sort of uh, orchestration uh, deployment solution for that, like Kubernetes or anything? And how does that play with the collocation of shards? Uh, so actually, uh, the cache. So basically, to deploy service, we use Ansible, but it's different from cache. So cache uh, is being replicated. Uh, from uh, from a, a part of the application itself, so it actually asks for the newer changes and apply them, compact them. So it's not happening through any uh, orchestration service as well. So basically, Thanks. the updates right are pushed to uh, S3 bucket, and the different nodes and different regions will pull these updates from from S3 bucket, yeah. and then apply this onto the individual cache in the region. Yeah. Questions? Currently, we are with 3.8 billion records. Average latency is about 3 milliseconds. Yeah. So, so it, it, I mean, this solution you can tweak it out according to your requirements. So, this one, like how much charge you want to have, how much uh, second level in, mem, uh, index you want to have. That will tr basically imply how much latency do you have. So you can fine tune those things according to your requirements right, and read patterns, basically. I mean, there's a, there's a trade off, basically. Because uh, for the second level cache, we have this indices that actually takes up memory in, a, in your heap. So if you want to increase the, the size of this block, right, basically, you have, you have, there's a corresponding increase in the, in the heap space usage as well. Oh, this is just a lookup. The lookups for the previous one when we were uh, this one is when we were just not updates were happening, but the, uh, in this actual updates are happening in the production right now. Uh, this is for five days data, and the uh, updates are happening all the time. Yeah. So as he mentioned that for in memory objects, the problem is the limit of RAM. So, for example, this one on disk size is 115 GB. If I try to put it in, in, for example, in Java in memory, it would be huge, like maybe eight times of it. So we kind of like don't want that kind of a huge RAM. The second thing is uh, we did consider some of the other alternatives. So we, we discarded in memory because of that, like Redis and all. It has addition. It's already in memory plus it has a network latency for it as well. And you can <laughs> Probably. Uh, yes. Do you happen to come across Chronicle Maps? Uh, Chronicle Maps? No, I have not. I, I think Chronicle Maps is a 
Yeah, I mean, basically, any any solution that requires a large amount of RAM or it needs to be distributed, right? Yeah. I, I guess I guess it doesn't apply. It still requires memory, though. It still requires memory. I it's mean, it, off heap memory. Off yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you still need memory. I mean, yeah. although it's off heap. I mean, this, this is similar to off, we're using off heap as well, but the difference is we are we are actually mapping it to this. So th th this size can actually be much larger than what you actually provision in, in terms of memory. And Linux basically handles what are the hot path and keeps it in the memory. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. That's about it, guys. So Thank you. Thank you very much, much for coming. Thank you.